to start out this morning in our study of Mark by looking at Deuteronomy. Surprise, surprise, huh? Start out studying Mark by looking at Deuteronomy. Well, that's it. The Bible is one book written by one God. It's all one book. It's all one message. So we jump around and we see how it all fits together. We're going to be in Deuteronomy to start off this morning. Deuteronomy 18. And before we get to that, by the way, that's going to be in the Church Bibles on page 238. But uh, we have reprinted our little uh, Bible study books. So we got lots of them now. Uh, the ones that you can hand out to people, self-study books, about uh, what are Kevin, seven lessons in there, six or seven lessons. Uh, basic Law and Gospel, Sin and Grace, uh, and, uh, huh? Uh, there's just a couple of typos I changed outside of that. Uh, but we've got hundreds of them now. We've reprinted them. So if you uh, would like to have some to just pass around, neighbors, friends, relatives, coworkers, whatever, uh, give them a chance to look in their own Bible that you're not pushing some weird Bible on them here. Uh, this is the, the, the one word of God. Maybe they have never really studied it before, never really even looked at it before. And it begins, the very first question is, what is the main message of the Bible? And uh, it gives a little uh, you know, Bible verse where they can look it up in their own Bible, and then lines they can write the answer down in their own words. Uh, they find the answer to these very important questions right there in the Bible. So we have plenty of them. Just ask, and uh, you shall receive. Uh, an unknown, obscure pastor, yeah, uh, who nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> Whose only interest was in exalting the name of Jesus Christ, not his name. Okay, uh, Deuteronomy 18. Now, why do I have you start in Deuteronomy, Old Testament, if we're going to be talking about the New Testament Gospel of Mark? Well, you may recall that what we're studying in Mark is Jesus' baptism. It occurs very early in the book, right in the middle of the uh, first chapter, uh, Jesus goes down from Nazareth to Jordan and is baptized by John the Baptist. And the question has arisen, why did Jesus have himself baptized at the age of 30? Not because he was a sinner. Uh, uh, John was pe preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, and Jesus had no sins. He is a perfect God-man. God cannot sin. So why do we get right away into Jesus' baptism and then uh, Jesus' temptation by the devil? Well, even though Jesus did not sin himself, as a true man, he was susceptible to sin and temptation, and he counted himself among sinners so that he could die in their place. So that's the first reason. He had to be numbered, as the Bible says, numbered with the transgressors. But the second reason is, as we've been talking about in the last lesson or two, this was Jesus' anointing. And that's an important word. Because the word anointing also, that's an English word, in the Hebrew language is Messiah. Messiah. And in the Greek, it's Christ. And all those important words in the Bible. Messiah, Christ, the anointed one. Anointed, chosen by God to uh, be inducted into an office. And in fact, three different offices. In the Old Testament, kings were anointed. That's when they began their reign was at that moment when oil was poured over their head. 
Then they became king. Prophets in the Old Testament, Israel, were anointed with oil, and that's when they became an official prophet of God. Uh, Priests in the Old Testament, Israel, were anointed, and that marked the beginning of their priesthood. Well, Jesus has to be anointed. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the chosen one of God to save us all. And this is his anointing, his baptism. This is when John pours water over his head instead of oil. He is baptized in the Jordan River, uh, as it says, and we'll get back to that in Mark in a moment. And uh, we have seen in examples in the previous lessons where the word anointing occurs in the Old Testament and is fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He said he was. Remember how he got up in his home synagogue in Nazareth, read an Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, and he then uh, he read the passage, he sat down, and then he said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. I am the one that is speaking in these verses. I am the one that these verses speak of. I am the promised Savior of the world. Okay, so his baptism is his anointing to begin a threefold office. He's going to be a prophet, a priest, and a king, all three. And I want to look at that today. So we look at the Old Testament, and then we see the New Testament and how they fit together in these, uh, in these ways that Jesus was anointed to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. We look first at prophet, and we have in uh, Deuteronomy 18, a verse that you've read before. We've read it many times over the years in worship. And um, here we have in Deuteronomy, the last of the books, five books of Moses, and this is uh, where Moses is leading the Israelites to the promised land. And uh, Moses <coughs> speaks here a prophecy in verse 15. You all have that. Deuteronomy 18:15 begins the Lord. And it's all capital, so that's the triune God, Jehovah. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. That is a prophecy of Jesus. Yes, Moses, well, of course, God is inspiring him. The Holy Ghost is inspiring him to speak these words all the way through. Moses is a prophet, as he says here, a prophet like unto me. So he's a prophet. In other words, he, he has uh, been anointed to convey the word of God to the Israelite nation. He is their prophet. He is the great prophet of the Old Testament. He is the one who receives the word of God and then speaks the word of God to the nation of Israel. Uh, he is the one inspired to write all of these first five books of the Bible. But here he's speaking, he says, now, just like I'm a prophet who, who hears the word of God and then speaks the word of God to you, so that you can believe and be saved. He will raise up unto you, unto thee, another prophet from the midst of thee. He'll be a descendant of the Israelite nation. He'll be an Israelite. He'll be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as we know from studying Genesis, he'll also be a descendant of Judah. He'll be a descendant of the tribe of Judah, and he'll be a descendant of King David. Uh, so God will raise up another prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. It won't just be any old 
run-of-the-mill prophet, he'll be a prophet like Moses, a great prophet who spoke to God face to face. Unto him ye shall hearken. Now, he's not talking about any of the other Old Testament prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. He's speaking about the greatest prophet. And I don't have time to get into it today, but he's like Moses, and he will be like Moses in many ways. Uh, That is a prophecy of Jesus. The prophet that God will raise up, he's speaking of Jesus God the Son. So Jesus is a prophet. He will speak the word of God. Uh, He will say, for example, on one occasion, I don't speak my words as a man. I'm not speaking man's word. I'm speaking the word that my father tells me. In other words, I'm speaking here the word of God. And we're going to see as we get into Mark later into chapter 1 how the first thing he does after he's, that that Mark mentions that he does after he's baptized and tempted of the devil in the wilderness the next thing he does is teaches. The very next thing, he teaches. He teaches the word of God. He goes into synagogues, it says. Every Sabbath day, he goes into synagogues and he speaks and he teaches the word of God. And he is such a great teacher that it says the people are just astonished at his teaching. How, how wise he is and how great a teacher he is. He is a prophet. He came not only to die for our sins as our sacrificial lamb, he came to teach us the greatest prophet of all time, the greatest teacher of all time. And here is a prophecy in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be uh, a prophet. And uh, it says, unto him ye shall hearken. You'll hear. Listen to him. Jesus often said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, Just like John the Baptist had to be sent to teach and to preach. The message has to get out. People can't believe what they've never heard. So preaching and teaching is so vitally important to the eternal life of people. Get the message of God's word out. And Jesus, God himself, came to teach us. Terry? Going back to John the Baptist, how would he, what does the word Baptist mean? Well, it wasn't a church at that time. No. uh, Well, as we said, uh, we had it on the board there a few weeks ago, baptism or uh, to baptize is a direct transliteration, meaning a direct carryover from another language of the word in Greek, baptizo. I baptize, first person singular, present. Baptizo in Greek. Uh, And then it has all of its other endings that would change the person and the the tense and so forth. Well, I'm not saying he took that name, but he, he was given... He's been given that name over the centuries because he did baptize. He was the first to baptize people. Yeah, and it means to wash, okay, with water. You can't wash things without water, okay? That's the, one of the things God gave us water for, uh, to wash things with, clean things with. So he used water now to baptize and... Uh, it, um, it is, yeah, in case you would get confused with uh, John the Apostle or so forth. No, 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 no. That's just, in fact, I don't know that in the Bible, I might be wrong on this, but I don't know in the Bible he's ever literally called John the Baptist sometimes called the Baptist, but that whole phrase, John the Baptist, I'm not even sure that ever occurs in the Bible. That's the name that he's given as a shorthand 
to refer to that man who was the forerunner of Jesus. Okay? So, when Jesus was baptized, he was anointed to be a what? A prophet. Yeah. A prophet. But not only was he anointed to be a prophet, let's go to the book of Kings. First Kings. First Kings 19. This is another in regard to a prophet, showing that a prophet is anointed. First Kings 19. And in the church Bibles, this will be page 436. 436. Book of First Kings, chapter 19. I want to begin at verse 13. You're all finding it, 1 Kings 19, 13. It begins, and it was so. Okay, we all have it. It was so when Elijah heard it. Now, what do you know about Elijah? He was a prophet, one of the prophets of God, a true prophet. And it was, uh, uh, you know, actually... uh, When Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, there appeared to him two Old Testament people who spoke with him. They'd been long since dead in regard to the world, but they were certainly alive. And when Jesus is transfigured, there appears unto him, and they converse with him. We even are told what they conversed about. Uh, He confers with two Old Testament people. And who were they? Very good. Moses and Elijah, two prophets. Probably the two greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Well, here it talks about Elijah. When Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now, this is the voice of God, of course. Verse 14, he said, I have been very jealous For the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Great persecution. Even the uh, uh, nation of Israel, the so-called chosen people of God, persecuted the prophets, the true prophets. That's right. So much for this, that if you're a descendant of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you're going to heaven automatically. They were some of the worst rejectors of God's word in the history of the world. Uh, They had the the word of God come to them and the prophets, and and, and most of the true prophets they would stone and, and treat horribly. And Elijah, he's just so depressed here. He says, I've been very jealous for you, Lord. You're the most important thing in my life. You're a top priority. I know that people need to hear your word to be saved. They need to hear about the, their sins. They need to hear about their coming Savior. I've been trying to tell these people, and all they do is they just hate me and, and persecute me, and they've, they've killed the other prophets, the other true prophets. It's a terrible situation. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over his area. Okay? That's the first thing. Anoint a king. You know what anoint means. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, Thou uh, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, in, in, in place of you. So there you have. Yes. No, no. But uh, 
He's going to do it anyway because at that point he can do that. Uh, God appoints all the leaders of all the nations, whether they're supposed to be the nations or not. There's really no such thing as a, as a Christian nation when you get right down to it. Nations don't believe. People, individuals believe. You might have a, a nation that by and large has a bunch of Christians in it, a very blessed nation, but that doesn't make it a Christian nation. But anyway, uh, the important reason I had you look at this was um, that God assigns Elisha to anoint kings and his successive prophet. Elisha, that'll take over for him because God is going to uh, take Elijah to heaven. Okay? But again, priests or, or prophets, I mean prophets are anointed. When was Jesus anointed? At his baptism. That's when he started teaching. Almost in the next few verses of Mark, we'll see he starts teaching after he's baptized. Now, let's go to another one, back to Leviticus, book of Leviticus, third book of the Bible, uh, Leviticus 8, and in the church Bibles, you're going to be on page 127, Leviticus 8. Now, we know that Moses was the great prophet of Israel who received the word of God and passed it on to the uh, nation of Israel, spoke for God. He would go into the tabernacle and God would speak to him. Then he'd go out and speak to the people. And he would go up on Mount Sinai, and God would speak to him for days. Then he'd bring the word of God down to the people. He was a great prophet. He had a brother. What was his brother's name? Aaron. Aaron, yeah. And God chose Aaron to be what? A prophet? A priest. The high priest. The priest above all the other priests. And uh, so we look at Leviticus 8, verse 12. And uh, here we see what began Aaron's uh, post as priest, verse 12. And he, meaning Moses, poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. That's when he began his position, his office of high priest. Okay? So priests are anointed. Now what is a priest? What is the office of a priest that they were anointed to do? Well, they were to offer sacrifices for the people to God. They were the mediator. They were the go-between. Here's God. He's perfect. He's holy. He cannot abide sin in his presence. Here's the human race, uh, completely sold under sin unclean, filthy, cannot approach God. So a priest would be the one in the middle between these two opposing enemies, you might say, who cannot abide each other. And it's the priest who, on behalf of the people, goes to God with sacrifices for their sins payment for their sins. Now, this is all symbolic in the Old Testament. But it all, <clears throat> they did this every day, and it would remind the people of the coming sacrifice of, of the Messiah. The, you know, we just sang this morning in uh, the opening Sunday school, Jesus, my great high priest. He is the one who stands between us sinners and holy God, and he brings the great true sacrifice, the payment for all our sins that makes us righteous 
and fit now to come to God. Remember Jesus died on the cross. The great curtain in the temple was ripped by invisible hands in two, dividing the holy of holies from the rest of the temple where the people were, symbolizing that now there is no more a separation between God and man. God and man are now at one, they're at peace. No more enemies. This was accomplished by the great high priest, uh, Jesus. In the Old Testament, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year, just once a year, and give an offering for all the people. That was a symbol of Jesus. Remind them of how Jesus would come. uh, So the priest is the go-between. He goes to God on behalf of the sinners and offers the sacrifice for their sins. Is Jesus a priest? Yes. He is our great high priest. He offered himself as the sacrifice before God on the altar of the cross in payment for all the sins of the world. And uh, Jesus said on the cross before he died, it is finished. And in Greek, that literally means it is paid. All of the sin debt that we had before God had now been paid. He had offered the sacrifice to pay for all sins. That particular sacrifice, yes. They could only enter in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a special room in the temple or the tabernacle that held the Ark, Ark of the Covenant. And uh, the top of the Ark of the Covenant was a, you might say, an altar where a sacrifice would be offered. And only the high priest could go in there. Nobody else could ever go in that room. And he could only go in it once a year. Now, what did that symbolize? What did that teach the people? There would only be one sacrifice for all sins. Just one. And it would only be done once by one person, our great high priest Jesus. Oh, he, okay. He, he, did, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have to he didn't have to sacrifice himself over and over and over again like the Catholics teach. You know, they teach every time there's a mass, every time Uh, they have what they call the Lord's Supper, that it is Jesus re-sacrificing himself for your sins. That's that's contrary to the Bible. The Bible clearly teaches Jesus in the book of Hebrews, he entered in the holy place once for all. There's only one real payment for your sins, but it's a great one. It's an infinite one. It's of infinite value. You don't need any other sacrifices. There are no other sacrifices. There's no other payment for your sin. Just the blood and death of Jesus. So he's a priest. He he cleanses the sinner and presents them and pleads for them with God. I've paid for their sin. Forgive them and accept them. Jesus is anointed at his baptism to be priest. Just like Elisha was anointed by Elijah to be a prophet. And just like Aaron was anointed to be the great high priest of Israel in the Old Testament. One left, what's that? Jesus was also anointed to be what? King. Let's go to the book of Psalms for an example of that. Psalm 89. Uh, this would be page 685 in your church Bible, 685, Psalm 89. Who is the greatest king of Israel? Very good, Terry. King David, yes. Uh, the Nation of Israel, we should, you might say it's high watermark under King David. He was a very faithful king. Was he perfect? No, he was a sinner. And uh, the prophet Nathan had to bring him to repentance. 
And he had paid a dear price. But he was still a great king. He was a prophet of God too. He, he wrote many of the Psalms under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But he was the great king. And uh, it was prophesied that his, one of his descendants would be the promised Messiah. So what better example of anointing a king than David? And in Psalm 89, God says in verse 20, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. So kings were anointed too. That's how they uh, began their reign with that ceremonial anointing. Is Jesus king? Yeah. In fact, when he uh, was born, the wise men came to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And when he died on the cross, what was hanging over his head, the sign, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Uh, Herod, uh, or I mean uh, Pontius Pilate wrote that as kind of a mocking thing, but he unknowingly wrote the truth. Yeah. When you especially consider that Israel, true Israel is what? God's people. God's real people. True people. Spiritual people. The true children of Abraham who are the Christians. All those in Old Testament, New Testament times who believe in the Messiah. Who believe that God has come or would come and save us himself. Would become a man and pay for our sins. Anyone who believes that, no matter when they lived in history, they are the true Israel. And all Israel will be saved, the Bible says. All who believe that will be saved. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the true Israel. Is Jesus king of the Christians? Yeah. It's not an earthly kingdom like other kingdoms, you know, with a land area and with borders and so forth. As Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. What he meant was, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's, a, it's in the hearts and souls of people who believe in him. He is our king. We obey him. We follow him. Uh, he leads us in battle against the forces of Satan and evil. Uh, so he is king of the church. That's number one. King of the holy Christian church. He is our leader, none other. Is he also king in another way? Does he rule the universe? Do you have proof of this? What? what huh? He created it? You weren't there, though. Are there witnesses of his uh, ruling over the world? <laughs> All his miracles, the grace of which is rising from the dead. He rules the universe. Remember how he calmed the storm just by willing it? The great storm that was about to sink the apostles in their boat? Be still. <laughs> Calm. Glass. Raise the dead. Lazarus, uh, Jairus' daughter, so forth. Uh, heal lepers, just like that. Heal the blind. Heal the deaf, uh, cast out demons, uh, turn water into wine. Uh, the next thing that happens in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 after he teaches is he heals. He heals a demoniac. He drives the demon out of him. Next thing he does is raise Peter, Simon Peter's mother from grave illness. Heals her just like that. He's king. He rules this world. He can do anything. He made this world, and he rules it. So he's king of the world. He's king of the universe in that he rules it. I said a moment ago, 
All kings, all rulers, all governors of all nations are appointed by God, the Bible says. Powers that be are of God. So it's all in his control. Don't ever forget that. He is king not only of the church, but of the whole world. Nothing's going to happen to you that he won't let happen for a good reason. So he's king. When was he anointed to be king? At his baptism. Well, that's that's at the end of his uh, earthly life, not the beginning. So you're saying he wasn't king until then? No, he was he was king of the church right from the beginning. Yeah. So. He's prophet, priest, and king. Is he still prophet, priest, and king? Does he still teach today? Yeah, through his word? Is his word the Bible? Um, is he still priest today? Does he still intercede for us and plead his blood for our forgiveness before God? The Bible says yes. He's our, our mediator. Is he still king today? Does he still rule the church? Does he still rule the universe? Yeah, he's alive. That's right. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. So why was he baptized? Two reasons. To be numbered with the transgressors and to be anointed into his beginning of his work now, as it said in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. All right, so let's go to Mark 1 and uh, pick it up there at Jesus' baptism. This is verse 10, Mark 1, verse 10. It says in verse 9, he was baptized of John in Jordan. Everybody see that? This is page 1078 in your church Bibles, 1078, Mark 1. And in verse 9, it simply says he was baptized. doesn't go into any great detail. You remember, Mark uh, is the succinct gospel. Or it just gets down to the nitty-gritty, you might say. Uh, and then in verse 10, and straightway, immediately, immediately, uh, at the same time, no, no hesitation. Straightway, it means immediately. Immediately, straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Uh, okay, I want to take this one section of time, first away, straightway coming up out of the water. As I had said before, the Baptists like to take this verse and say, see, Jesus was immersed. You see the word immersed in there anywhere? Anywhere in the context you see immersed. So are they reading into the Bible? Or are they just taking the Bible as it reads? I say they are reading into the Bible something that they, their preconceived notions. They want it to say immersed, so they take this word in, or I mean not in, but out of, coming up out of the water. They say, well, he must have been then in the water. And that's true. He was in the water. But it doesn't say he was totally submerged in the water. If he was simply standing in the river, he would still be in the river, right? Isn't that the way we speak? He had been in the water, but it never says he was under the water. That would be necessary if he was immersed. Uh, we talked about anointing, that Jesus was anointed. Prophets were anointed, priests were anointed, kings were anointed in the Old Testament. Does it ever speak of a prophet, priest, or king being immersed when he was anointed? How did the anointing occur? Yeah, the oil was poured over their head. Never talks about immersion there either. Okay, so I won't say I've said things about this before. 
I'm not going to say any more about it, but the Baptists are so insistent on this that you must be immersed. If you haven't been immersed, you haven't been baptized. That is false doctrine. That is dangerous teaching. Telling people they haven't been baptized when they have? That borders on blasphemy. That's right. That's, that's, a, that's an effect what they're saying. Even if it's set up out of the water, they still say, well, it means immersion. Well, no, I don't say immerse, but I can see how they would read that in. Yes, but you see, that's the problem. That's why we have 20 different churches in Pena, because people read into the Bible what's not there. And that's why we have different teachings and different practices among the churches. And you have to finally say, what does the Bible really say? Now, we don't deny immersion. Sure, that is one form of washing, but that's what baptizo means. It means wash. And you can wash, and it means apply water. You can apply water in many different ways. But they are so strict that they say, no, it doesn't mean wash. It's got to mean immerse. And uh, we say, you're reading into the Bible what is not there. In fact, as we said a moment ago, anointing never occurred by immersion. It always occurred by pouring. You will be hard-pressed to ever find the word immerse in an English translation of the Bible. Well, of course they did because they're Baptist offshoots. I know they were. Well, Immersion was not considered a uh, usual form of baptism until the Anabaptist movement during uh, the Lutheran Reformation. Yeah, in the 1500s. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, it's a valid form of baptism. We don't deny that. But the Baptists deny us. Our form of baptism. Huh? If they wanted to, sure. But if they're on their deathbed in a hospital and they're going to die in five minutes, I wouldn't recommend it. Or if it's in the middle of winter and the, the bodies of water are frozen over, I wouldn't advise they wait until summer. Doesn't make it the only valid form of baptism. No, I'm just saying how deep the word got here. Yeah, that's what I mean. They've been taught something that's not in the Bible, but they believe it because their preacher told it to them over and over and over and over again that they stopped listening to the Bible and started listening to their preacher. So we have to be careful of that. That we don't set a hard and fast teaching and practice in the church that we can't point to clearly in the Bible. Okay? Now, going back to verse 10, and straightway coming up out of the Lord, you would say that whether he was immersed or whether he wasn't. You'd say the same thing. He saw the heavens open. Who's he? You know, it's a pronoun, refers to a noun, referred to earlier, the antecedent. Who is he? He saw the heavens open. I don't think so. I think it's John. Yeah, I think it's John, and we'll get to that. Uh, let's go to the Gospel of John. <laughs> the editor, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, let's go to John 1, because here we have a more complete description of the baptism of Jesus. Maybe that's like what Mark 1 said. It says, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him, him being Jesus. When you read it that way, it's confusing. It, it, when you read it, it's confusing. <laughs> You're not sure who it is. Obviously, the spirit descended upon Jesus. Okay, But he saw the heavens opened. Well, Jesus might have seen it too, but I don't think that's the only one that saw the heavens open. Why do I say that? Let's go to the Gospel of John. Yeah, well, again, that's an editorial comment. Uh, some editors say, I'm going to capitalize every pronoun that refers to God. Some don't. It's a matter of choice. But anyway, John 1... The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 30. This is page 1,148, 1,148 in the church Bibles. John 1. And, uh, well, let's pick it up, verse 29. That's the beginning of the paragraph. Begins the next day, John. Okay? And John there meaning John the Baptist, not John the the, uh, Apostle. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come uh, baptizing with water. And John bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Who saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove? John did. Verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom? Thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John saw it. And also John the Apostle writer, or the Apostle of the Gospel writer saw it. I'm not saying everybody that was around at that moment saw it. But those guys saw it. They testified to it. Okay? Again, the the purpose of an apostle is to be a witness of these things. Had to witness everything from Jesus' baptism to Jesus' ascension. So it's important because there are eyes and ears for us. There are other average human beings who God chose to be witnesses and to write it down under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost for all the ages. He's another one. Yeah, he's an apostle. Yeah. Aha. That's why they said, you're not an apostle, Paul. He said, ah, but I did something just as good. I met with Jesus for three years in the wilderness. First of all, I saw him on the road to Damascus. He appeared to me. And then if you read his epistles carefully, he said, Jesus personally appeared to me for three years and taught me. He might not have witnessed these events, but Jesus personally appeared to him and taught him after his ascension into heaven. That was his claim to be an apostle, and the church accepted it. First, they argued with him. Even some of the other apostles had a little problem with him at first. Then they accepted him as an apostle. Okay? Good question. Good question. Okay. So, uh, just to close up today, verse 10, straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened. I believe that's referring to John the Baptist. And the spirit, like a dove, descending upon him, meaning Jesus. Upon Jesus. God willing, we'll pick it up there on Thursday and uh, go on with that verse.
Shall we close with a benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.